for this evening is how can we know God exists? Yep. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on a Sunday night. Really good to see so many of you here. It's wonderful. And um, I hope that it is going to be a blessing to you. I'm going to probably come down here and talk to you. And I'm going to ask that question. And I think I've got a bit of a lag. How can we know that God exists? It's actually a really important question, isn't it? Because obviously you can't see God. And most things we establish through our senses, don't we? You know, we... Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll take the question can't hear me fine, but it would be helpful if the mic's on, right? Can you hear it now? Kind of? Yeah. Um, like, we have, how do we know the cake exists? Because we, could, we can see the cake, we touch it, we put it into our mouth, we can taste it, we can smell it, we know it exists. But how do we know God exists? That's the difficult thing to work out. And I, I'm going to suggest to you there's three kind of realms of evidence that we could look at tonight. One is creation, the second is our conscience, and the third is Christ. So we're going to think about creation, how can we know God exists? Anyone know what's on that slide there? Yeah. It's the pillars of creation, yeah. It's part of, um, not the Horsehead Nebula, but another nebula. And it's just incredible. That actually was taken from a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. He talks about the Christ child being born at Christmas and holding um, holding in his hands the pillars of creation, even though he's a little baby, the mystery of incarnation. And so, yeah, it's this phenomenal kind of, they're made out of, um, I think, hydrogen gas and just incredible to see the world, the universe that we live in, and we're living on this third rock from the sun. How do we know from creation that God exists? Now, I'm going to go and do a little bit of um, natural theology, but I want to show you how that, that kind of interfaces with the Bible as well. It's a man called Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and I want to introduce you to a few concepts. It's going to stretch your brain a little bit tonight. I hope you've got, had enough brain sugar from your cake. I want to think about a concept of infinite regress. So, you, you can't actually have a sequence of events that goes back infinitely, and that's impossible. The reason why that's impossible is that if there was an infinite sequence of events, then we would never arrive at you and me today. You wouldn't exist, because there would have to be an infinite sequence of events taking place, so you would never get to the present day. i put it another way. If I take this Bible, and... What's your name? Paul. Paul. And I want to get that Bible to Paul but I pass it to an infinite number of people first, will Paul ever get the Bible? He won't. So it's important to think about this idea of an infinite regress of events, and I'll show you why in a minute, why it's important to see that you cannot have an infinite regress of sequential events, okay? Are you with me so far? Okay? You can pick this up later if you want. Because Aquinas had these five proofs as to God's existence. Some of you guys might have heard of this before. If you haven't, it's fairly interesting. I hope it's fairly interesting. Um, So he he noticed that everything that we observe in this world that you can see, right, everything changes or moves or is created. So again, you've moved, you've changed, you know, you may have, since you last met each other, you might have put on weight, lost weight, your hairs might have gone a bit grey or fallen out, um, or if you're young, you might have grown a bit taller, or if you're a lad, you might have gone to the gym and grown some muscles, you know, but everything changes and everything moves and everything's made, everything you observe. And... Aquinas noticed that everything that moves or is changed or is made has been moved or changed or made by something else, right? And that thing was made by something else and that thing was changed by something else. Everything you see in this room, the chair is there because someone put it there and before that someone built it and there's a, a chain of events. But remember, there isn't an infinite regress. You can't have an infinite chain of events and chains of movements and changes and things being made by other things. There has to be an unchanged changer or an unmade maker or an unmoved mover. There has to be, if you can see the picture in the background, a hand that presses the first domino to start the chain of motion and events. Okay, that was was Aquinas' first argument. And his second argument was called the first cause argument, which has been developed very strongly in the last uh, 40 years by a guy called William Lane Craig, who I recommend his stuff. I don't agree with absolutely everything he says, but I think he's a really, he's probably the most gifted Christian philosopher alive today, if you're interested in you know, loving God with your mind as well as with your heart and your soul and your strength. And um, William Lane Craig in 1979, I wrote a book called The Kalam Cosmological Argument. And it goes like this. It says, everything that begins to exist has a cause, right? Everything that comes into existence has some kind of cause. The universe began to exist. Now, there's some debate about that. But most people, most scientists and philosophers would say that there was a moment when the universe came into existence. Therefore, the universe has a cause. 
And if the universe has a cause, then an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists, who is unlike the universe. The universe has a beginning, this creator has no beginning. The universe changes, this creator is changeless. This, the universe is material, the creator is immaterial. The universe operates in terms of time and space. This creator is outside of time, outside of space. And it's obviously incredibly powerful in, if he's going to be able to create the universe that we live in. And that shows that God exists. So that's the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, I know I'm going quickly. You can ask me questions at the end. I want to keep to Chris's 7 o'clock time if I possibly can. A guy called Michael Shermer, who's an atheist, a skeptic, he said this. See what you think about this. He said the first cause and prime mover argument, the first two arguments I've given you, brilliantly proffered by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 14th century. It's actually 13th century, so he's already wrong on that one. But anyway. Um, and brilliantly refuted by David Hume in the 18th century, is easily turned aside with just one more question. So this is his, like, zinger, right? The atheists and skeptics that come out with these zingers. They go, ah, oh, you know, who or what caused and moved God, or who created God, all right? Now, he hasn't read them carefully enough, right? He said, who caused and moved God? Now, it says everything that begins to exist has a cause. It doesn't say everything has a cause, all right? It says everything that begins to exist. Now, the whole point of the definition of God is somebody that did not begin to exist, right? In the Bible, he's described as the great I am. I am who I am. The one who has the quality of aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, the quality of existence within himself. He doesn't depend on anybody else to create him. He has always existed. So the idea of who created God is a nonsense question because the definition of God is an uncreated being. All right? So this guy hasn't listened carefully enough. When he says who or what caused and moved God, doesn't need a cause because he didn't come into existence. He contains the property of existence within himself. Now, it still might blow your mind a little bit, but we don't actually, not everything requires a cause. Only things that, can, only effects require causes. You are the effect of your parents, all right, coming together. And they are the effect of their parents. You are an effect, I'm an effect. But God is the first cause. He doesn't require a cause because he's the first cause. So this kind of zinger argument, you hear it all the time, oh, who created God? Well, whoever you're talking about, if he's created, that's not God. The definition of God is the uncreated first cause and first mover. Now this actually, you do see it in the Bible. So let's get to the Bible. And you get to the book of Romans, which is a really excellent book and explains God's plan of salvation for anyone who comes to Christ. I won't read the whole thing, but basically it says, if we go to uh, verse 19, verse 18 actually, it talks about people suppressing the truth. So the Bible actually assumes that we all kind of know that God exists, but we prefer not to believe that because it's convenient for us because then we can sin as we please, right? Adam and Eve in the garden acted as if God did not exist. They took the fruit from God's tree. And we suppress the truth, a bit like holding someone under the water trying to drown them. I don't, wanna, I don't really want to think about it because I don't want to be accountable. Verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now this is how it ties in with Aquinas. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, the first cause, the first mover, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. You can reason back from the effects to the first cause. Right? So you can, how do you know there's a creator? Because you look at the created world. It's a bit like, how do I know that there is a, if you had a painting up on the wall here, how would I know that there was a painter? Well, the painting itself is evidence of the, of the painter, isn't it? Yeah, it would be absurd if I was to say um, that this mobile phone just came about by accident. The evidence that there is a designer is the thing itself. Okay, so you can infer from the visible created world that there's an invisible creator behind it. And yet that's something that we want to suppress because we have our own reasons to go away from God. Now this one is another interesting argument that Aquinas came out with. It's the argument of necessary being. Can anyone recognise who is in the picture behind that? It's from a movie in the 1980s, probably the best movie in the 1980s. Back to the Future, that's right. I went to see that when I was 10 years old. It was so exciting. It's a brilliant film. Um, um, my wife took me there for my 47th birthday. We went to see the musical in London. It's great fun. Marty McFly goes to 1955 from 1985. Hands up if you've seen the movie. If you haven't, please watch it. It's brilliant. <laughs> and I don't want to give you too many spoilers. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, but um, basically there's a bit in the, in the film where he's playing a guitar and his hand starts to disappear because in 1955, trying to avoid spoilers, <laughs> in 
his parents look like they're not going to get together. All right, so if they don't get together, they're not going to cause the effect that is Martin McFly. And so his hand starts disappearing, and his brother and sister start disappearing from a photograph that he's got in his pocket. Because he understands if his parents don't get together, then he ceases to exist in the future, right? So part of the mission that he's on is to get his parents together. Snag is that his mum is falling in love with him, which is, anyway, that's another story. So <laughs> watch, watch the movie. <laughs> oh, it's a really good film. Sounds a bit weird, but it is a good film. And you see his hands disappearing in the picture, right? And a famous philosopher called Leibniz, he said, why is there something rather than nothing? You ever thought about it? How come stuff exists rather than nothing exists? You, you look at all, there's so much empty space in the universe, and yet here we are existing in, in, in very defined, formed beings, in remarkable, miraculous, you know, nine body systems, endocrine system, muscular system, skeletal system, cardiovascular, all these different things going on inside our bodies. We don't have no idea. There's loads of organs, there's loads of cells. You've got, was it 50 million cells in your body at least? And you don't really think about it. Your pancreas is working right now, processing the sugars. And how is that all so orderly when there's just so much nothing out there? Why is there something rather than nothing? And Aquinas said, we observe things that could not have existed, right? So Marty McFly may not have existed if his parents hadn't got together. You wouldn't have existed if your parents hadn't have got together, obviously. So there's a possibility that you would never have existed, right? You and I are what's called contingent beings. We don't have the necessity of being within ourselves. It's not absolutely necessary that you exist. It might have been that you didn't exist if it hadn't been that your mum and dad had met that day. And da -da -da. My mum and dad met. Um, my dad was bringing a present from Turkey to my mum's flatmate or something random like that and they ended up going, oh, I like you. And then it worked out like that. If they hadn't had that meeting, I wouldn't exist, right? So Aquinas is saying there must be one being who's behind all of this, who's not contingent, who's not dependent on other beings, who is the necessary being, who has to exist, that has the property of existence within himself, upon whom all other things depend, and is the ultimate explanation for their existence. It's an interesting argument. Now, this is in the Bible as well. Paul, when he goes to Athens, and he's talking to the philosophers there, the Epicureans and the Stoics, he says, guys, why are you thinking that God dwells in a house made with hands? Why are you thinking that God is like an idol, like a, a block of stone or wood or gold? God, we don't make God, God made us. And he says this, he says, verse 25, he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he's a necessary being, he's not contingent, he's not dependent. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, right? So we are all part of that chain of being that goes back to the first cause, the first mover, the necessary being who's God. So Aquinas is saying, we all, verse 28, in him we live and move and have our being. So um, I hope this is coming together in your mind. Now, there's another argument he gave, which is called the degrees of perfection. And you see the dial on there where it goes from poor to good. And you say, oh, that was a good game of football, but that was the best game of football. Or you could say, who's the, who's the GOAT? You know, it's quite often young people say, oh, he's the GOAT. Lionel Messi is the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And you might have an area in your life where you, you love golf or you love cricket or you love might not be a sport, it might be a musician. You might say, Elvis is the greatest of all time, or the Beatles. And everybody's got this kind of scale in their mind about what the best is and what the worst is, right? Do you have that in your mind? This is the greatest movie, it's the worst movie. Shawshank Redemption is factually the greatest movie of all time, for example. That's just a fact. Uh, it says it on IMDb as well. So we have this idea in our minds of scales where we rank things and rate things, and that's the best. But how do we know what the scale, how do we know we're going in the right direction? Maybe what we think is the best of all time is the worst of all time. Maybe all the time that Lionel Messi is kicking the goal, ball in the goal, he's kicking it in the wrong goal, which would make him the worst of all time. So how do we even measure what, what it means to be good, better, best, or bad, worse, worse? How do we even know, especially in terms of morality, what's good and what's not good? In the Middle East right now, there's a war. And if you turn on your TV or watch YouTube, Everyone's going, no, they're the bad guys. No, they're, they're the bad guys. You know, have you heard that? And they interview people and they go, no, 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 we're the good guys. They're the bad guys. Every single person. The Israelis, the Palestinians are the bad guys. Palestinians, the Israelis are the bad guys. You think, I can't work this out. We need some kind of scale to measure things on. Now, Aquinas said, if you're going to have this idea of bad, worse, worse, good, better, best, there has to be something right at the end of the spectrum, which is the pinnacle of perfection, and that is God. How would we ever be able to measure morality unless there was an ultimate moral lawgiver? That's God. That comes in the Bible. In the Psalms in particular, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. 
The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. David says, to all perfection I see a limit. Right? So David's looking on his scale of good, better, best. He sees all the people in his life and he's like, there's no perfect person. You've never met a perfect person, have you? I remember one time I met a woman and I was in Watford when me and Chris were in Watford. And we were doing open air evangelism. And she said, I'm a perfect person and I've never done anything wrong in my, in my whole life. And she was in her 60s. and you know, Helen's like, what? <laughs> she was in her 60s or 70s. And then her adult daughter came by. And I said, can I just check with your daughter? Has your mum ever done anything wrong in her whole life? And the daughter looked at her mum. She went, no, my mum has never done anything wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting. So, you know, there are some people that think they're perfect. I actually know a guy who's a contract killer. And he thinks he's perfect. He actually killed people for money. Um, and I think the only way that he could deal with the immorality of what he did was just to say I'm a perfect person and everything I do is justified. But he's not a perfect person. He kills people for money and that's not good. How do we know it's not good? Because we've all got a scale of morality in our head that says it's not good to kill people. Where does that come from? Okay, it comes from God. To all perfection I see a limit, but to your, your commands are boundless. God is the ultimate pinnacle of perfection. Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are you kidding me, Jesus? How are you, you're asking me to be as perfect as my heavenly father who is the pinnacle of perfection. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is a radical manifesto for the kingdom of God that is impossible to do unless there's some radical change that happens in your heart. It can only take place if God changes you and makes you a new creation. We'll come back to that. The last, last argument that Aquinas came out with is intelligent design. And he said basically, it's also known as the teleological argument or the argument of the final cause or the argument from beauty and order or fine-tuning of the universe. And the guy called William Paley, he came along and he said, imagine you're walking along on a path and you found a rock and it's just as a lump, a pebble or rock and you just kicked it out of the way. And you walked a bit further and you found a watch lying on the ground. There it is. And it's got a lovely gold case with a chain and it's ticking away. And you think, oh, you just kick it out of the way because it's like a rock. But it isn't. It's clearly different from a rock, right? A watch is very different from a rock because it's clearly been designed you can see that it has beauty, function, purpose, elegance, mechanisms in order to achieve a purposeful outcome, i.e. to tell you the time. And that's what Paley re- said, clearly there must be a designer. Because if you look at the universe, everything has a design type function. Okay? For example, all the different constants of the universe, like the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, gravity, all of those things have to be calibrated exactly right for us to life to actually be permissible in this planet. We have to be the right distance away from the sun, don't we? If we were any closer to the sun, we'd boil. Any further away, we'd freeze. We're exactly right. This is a life-permitting scenario that we're in. Okay, now atheists do have comebacks and arguments against that, and maybe you have some. But it is really interesting how it seems to be so perfectly designed. We're called the Goldilocks planet, right? Neither too hot nor too cold, right? Remember? She was having that. So we're living on a Goldilocks planet. Why is it that... (coughs) You know, trees breathe out carbon, breathe out oxygen and breathe in carbon dioxide, and we do the opposite. It's extremely convenient, isn't it? How is it that bees get the pollen on their legs and they go and pollinate other plants and they themselves get the nectar so they can create honey, which we can eat? It's the only food that doesn't go off, isn't it? Honey, you just leave it in the cupboard, it never goes off. It's amazing. Because God is an intelligent designer. You look in a, you look in a mirror and you see yourself moving around the way you can just, your brain can tell your hands and your eyes and your mouth can move like this. If, you, if, I, was, if I told you suddenly that actually I'm an AI-powered robot, you'd just be blown away because you'd think no one could design something that smoothly made, you know? And yet, we somehow say, oh, yeah, that's an amazingly well-designed AI robot going like this, but then you see a man moving the way I am, you say, yeah, it all came about by accident. It's ridiculous. Clearly, we've been designed by a very intelligent designer. And we see that in the Bible where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. As I was driving down here tonight, beautiful sun and dark clouds and the sun piercing through it. And you see all the colours, the red and the green and the yellow of all the leaves coming out of the trees. And it was just like, wow, what an artist God is to create this world. And you can read in Job in particular, when God comes and speaks to Job in the Old Testament. And he says, where were you when I laid down foundations of the earth? And God places everything in its appropriate habitat. Polar bears, where they need to be in the cold regions, and marsupials, and monkeys, and whales, and everything is in its proper place in the world. The only thing that's out of shape really is us, because we're rebelling against him. Okay, so those are the first five arguments from Aquinas. I'll just quickly go back through. You can see these again. 
by all means, ask me any questions and I'll probably fob you off on Chris and get him to answer them. Um, so Aquinas pointed out there's an unmoved mover who made all the other objects move. There's a first cause that created all the effects that stem from that. He talked about necessary being, that there has to be a being who could not have failed to exist because all of us could have failed to exist. We're all contingent. Um, he talked about this idea of degrees of perfection. How would we know what the best is unless there was somebody there who was telling us? And he talked about an intelligent designer. So that's creation, I think, is the first witness that we have. When we look around, we see from creation there must have been a creator. But the second witness that I want to bring to you tonight is the idea of conscience. Okay? A man called Jean-Jacques Rousseau is another philosopher. He wasn't really a Christian. But he said, reason deceives us, but conscience never. Have you got a conscience? It's quite scary when you meet people that have no conscience. I think there are such people. The Bible talks about people that have burned their conscience with a hot iron. Uh, sociopaths and psychopaths. People that can just happily just take money off people. I don't know if you guys have ever read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde is a character in that classic book who has no conscience. And it's terrifying when you meet someone like that because they don't care how much pain they cause to other people. But thankfully, it's rare. Einstein said, never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it. Interesting, isn't it? So even if the government's telling you to do something, if your conscience is saying it's not right, can you think of someone who paid the price in the Bible of going with their conscience instead of obeying the government? Anyone think of somebody like that? They said, I, I can't do this. Say again? Daniel, Daniel exactly. Daniel was told the government passed the law, you know, you have to be COVID tested and you, you can't pray for that. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, can't, you can't pray for 40 days except in King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel just carried on praying out the window. He could have closed the window, but he, car he carried on praying and he got arrested and he got put into the lion's den. That was the price of following his conscience. And yet he would rather violate the law than violate his conscience. Mahatma Gandhi said... There is a higher court than courts of justice, and that is the court of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. Albert Camus, another philosopher, French philosopher, he said, a guilty conscience needs to confess. A work of art is a confession. If you read Camus' books, the guy was very messed up. One of his books was all about what, why we should or shouldn't kill ourselves. Um, he's, a, he's a good goalkeeper. <laughs> he played for the Algerian national side, I think. You, have to, you tell me that later if I'm right, Ruby. Um, and he died in a car crash. But he was an interesting guy. And he, he basically, you can see his artwork, it's very tortured, his writing. And it's like he's trying to confess something. But because he didn't believe in God, he didn't know what he was confessing or who he was confessing to. And this is, this is a funny quote. A clear conscience is usually the sign of a bad memory. <laughs> I don't know about you, I've got an oversensitive conscience. So if I go around someone's house and I leave a little mark on the wall because I, I kind of scrape my bag against the wall or something. I really worry about it, like the whole way home. You know, like if I, if I sort of um, don't pay for a car park and the barrier's open and I go through and I haven't paid for my ticket, I will worry about that for like the next three weeks. I'm a very, very sensitive. Are you like that? Anyone like that? Anyone got an oversensitive conscience? No, you're just all really well-adjusted people. Like <laughs> Some people got undersensitive unsensitive conscience. They'll just quite happily go around someone's house and just take their towel out of their bathroom and go home with it and it's absolutely fine and you know some people are just quite relaxed about stuff but all of us have got some kind of conscience I think and maybe we've just got a bad memory now the Bible does talk about conscience what is a conscience a conscience is a reflection an inward stamp if you like of God's law that's been written on our hearts that's what the Bible says so Paul again talking in Romans chapter 2 chapter 1 is where he talks about creation chapter 2 is where he talks about conscience and he says, it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Talking about the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses. Indeed, when Gentiles, that's people who don't know about the law of Moses, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, other times defending them. So what it's saying is, even people that have never heard about God or religion, or the Bible, or Moses, still kind of inwardly know that it's wrong to steal. 
still kind of know that it's wrong to sleep with someone else's husband or wife. Still kind of know that disrespecting your parents is not a good thing. There's culture, you know, since cultures change around the world, and some cultures, for example, the way we've got to now with sexuality is in the West, we say that all loads and loads of forms of sexuality are really good. We used to think they weren't good, but now we think they're brilliant. Have you noticed that? We've got to celebrate them and have rainbow flags, and it's all wonderful. That's where we're at in the West. In Russia, they're like, no, we don't want any of that. In, in a lot of African countries, sub-Saharan Africa, they're passing laws saying, no, we don't want that. And you think, who's right? Is it the people who have a liberal, at progressive attitude towards sexuality, or the people who have a traditional attitude? But the fact is, we all have an attitude about sexuality. We all have some sense of conscience about it. We all kind of know that it's not okay that if you've made a promise to be with somebody, to then go with somebody else, right? We know that, don't we? That's kind of written on our hearts. We kind of know that it's not okay just to walk into a shop and take a load of stuff. We know that, don't we? We kind of know that it's not okay to lie to your best friend. Like, it's not okay to do that. It's not okay to envy. We kind of know there's something wrong with that because it kind of makes us bitter inside. So we have the law written on our hearts that we have this thing called a conscience. It's a real nuisance sometimes. You want to get rid of it. You want to turn down the volume on your conscience. I don't want to, no, I just want to do the wrong thing. You know, I know I shouldn't be watching that thing on Netflix, but I like it. I know I shouldn't be sending those horrible text messages, but I, I, I want to let that person know that they hurt me, so I'm going to be vindictive, because I enjoy it. You know, We all have that conscience, and it's just irritating, because we want to be able to do things, and it, it keeps on telling us we can't do them, or we should do them. Now, we do get conscience in the Bible, and David was a man who had an oversensitive conscience, I think, because he was in a situation where this guy Saul was trying to kill him, and David was hiding in a cave, and Saul went to take a, have a wee in the cave, <laughs> randomly. And um, David crept up behind him and cut a little bit off his coat. And then Saul went away. Now, Saul's been trying to kill David for many months. Now, you think that's not a big deal that David's cut a little bit off his coat. David could have stabbed the guy while he was having a, going to the toilet, but he didn't. David felt terrible about it in his conscience. And he, realized, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. David realized that Saul was the king chosen by God, and he had no right to touch him, even to cut off his cloak. Because David had a conscience that had been put there by God. Now, maybe you could say it's a bit oversensitive, but it was clearly something that bothered him. Where does that come from? Where does that conscience come from? If not God. Camus was right. A guilty conscience needs to confess. But a work of art cannot atone for guilt, but the ultimate sacrifice can. This is what we do with our consciences, what we should do. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they're outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? The conscience is telling you something is wrong. It's a bit like pain in your body. If your tooth is aching all the time, you need to go to the dentist, right? Conscience is like a painful tooth. It's saying something's not right. You are out of line with your creator and you need to come and find a solution. And the Bible solution is Christ. So that's going to come on to our last point tonight. And then I'll stop. How can we know God exists because of Christ? When you read the most important, probably the most important chapter in the whole of the Old Testament, I mean, there are many important chapters in the Bible, but Isaiah 53, hands up if you've ever read Isaiah 53. Have you ever read that? Wonderful chapter. It's, it's described as the fifth gospel. It was written 700 years before Jesus even came onto this planet. And yet it's such a clear portrait of Jesus that in some ways it's even clearer than Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Isaiah 53. I went to a synagogue once and they had it cut out. They didn't want to read it because it was so clearly talking about Jesus. So clearly talking about Jesus. And when you read the passage, we won't look at it tonight, we haven't got time. But we find in this that there's nothing physically special about Jesus. You know all the movies, Jesus is like super good looking guy. Like this kind of really just tanned, this lovely beard and everything. He's probably at six foot two. He's pretty hence, he's been definitely hitting the weights and stuff. Jesus, Jesus wasn't like that. He's probably shorter, maybe even weedier than me, right? Can you imagine? Right? So just, just a very insignificant looking guy, nothing special about him at all. All right? And he was rejected and despised. He suffered the wrath of God against sin. When he died on the cross, he, remember what he said? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the sky went black at midday 
And all of the anger of God against human beings was laid on Jesus. His punishment bought and brought us peace. He didn't defend himself to get out of being murdered. Nobody stood up for him as he was falsely condemned. He'd never been violent or deceitful, but suffered as if he had. Imagine, he never told a single lie in all his life. They tried to find some dirt to put it on Jesus, and they couldn't find anything. All the witnesses contradicted each other. And then finally they thought, well, the only thing we can say is that he's claiming to be a king, and that's a threat to the Roman Empire. It was so lame. that, like, There's one funny bit I love, I can quickly share with you. They're about one point in the Gospels, and I think it's John 10, they're picking up these rocks to stone Jesus to death. And he says, guys, before you stone me to death, for which of my good deeds were you stoning me? <laughs> which of my good deeds? Because there's no bad deeds. Jesus never did anything wrong. He never lied. He never stole. He never lusted after a woman. He had loads of women coming into his direction, beautiful women probably, and he just cared for them. He loved them. He healed them. He never laid a finger on them. When he had an opportunity to be violent, he said to Peter, put away your sword. You know, he healed the man who came to arrest him. The guy had his ear cut off and Jesus got his ear off the ground and stuck it back on his head. What a wonderful man Jesus Christ is. You cannot find a flaw with this man. Even though he was momentarily crushed by death, he returned to crush death forever. Jesus is the only person who came back from the dead and is still alive today. When you look at the empty tomb of Jesus, that should be compelling evidence for the existence of God. Because who but God could raise a man from the dead? Look into it. Find, think about all the alternative explanations. Did Jesus faint? Did he not really die properly? Did the disciples steal the body? Was it, did he have a twin brother? Was it a hallucination? None of, those, none of those explanations stand up to the fact that this man was raised by God from the dead, proving God's existence and proving that he's the son of God. And so we have an encouragement in the Bible that if we are willing to look at creation and see that there must be a creator, because what is created points to a creator, if we're willing to look inside and look at our consciences and see that something's broken inside, and then we're willing to look up to Christ and see him hanging there on the cross, taking away our sin, and then we look to the empty tomb and we see that he's conquered death, you've only got two problems really in life. One is your guilt and the other is your death. You're guilty, you're going to face judgment, and the other is you're going to die. I know some of you are young people, but it will happen to you. Only two things in life are certain, isn't it? Death and taxes, all right? <laughs> and when you're young, you get neither of them. When you get old, you get loads of that kind of thing. So we're going to face death, we're going to die, and we're going to face judgment. And Jesus has come to take away our punishment. He's come to give us eternal life. That's what he promises to anyone who will turn to him. Those are the evidences that I've presented to you tonight. I hope that you will think about it. Some of you already believe. I hope it strengthened your belief. Some of you are not sure. You're skeptical. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much for coming because not everybody's willing to do that on a Sunday night.